when he went out to, on a missionary journey, he, he left from Antioch. When he came back, he came back to Antioch. That was the center of New Testament Christianity. In fact, many of the originals that we have today may have been penned there. Originals? Did he just say some of the originals that we have today may have been penned there? Uh, we don't have any originals. And in fact, the earliest truly Byzantine manuscripts are four centuries down the road. Um, we have some gospel manuscripts from around that time period, but originals? Um, we don't have originals. Uh, so I have no idea what he's referring to. This is a part of the King James only argument that if it's from Antioch, it's good. If it's from Alexandria, it's bad. And again, um, the fact of the matter is, we don't know quotations. Why not? Uh, you see, the, the discussion about Egypt, well, Egypt's a sign of evil things in the Bible. Okay, so where does the Bible teach this mentality about Antioch and Egypt? Well, it doesn't. You'd have to go to early church writers because we're only, we're actually talking about the period of after the New Testament where manuscripts are being produced and written, right? And so if we go to that period, then you can actually demonstrate that there is an, there is an Antiochian mindset. Quote somebody. Versus a Egyptian mindset. Quote somebody. I can quote people down in Egypt that were weird. Clement of Alexandria, origin. But I can also quote people in Egypt that were not weird. Uh, that were, in fact, very solid in their view of Scripture. So, where, where is this mindset coming from? Given that there were different kinds of people in both locations. There were people with good theology in Antioch, and there were people with bad theology in Antioch, and good theology in Egypt, and bad theology in Egypt, and all of this is based upon the false idea that all the manuscripts came from one of these two places, which of course is not true. I mean, there were wherever there were Christians, there were manuscripts being produced. Greetings and felicitations. I'd like to thank you and welcome you to this 8th video, 8B. There's going to be three parts here, 8A, 8B, and 8C, hopefully. And uh, these are just tying up some loose ends, uh, statements that Dr. White makes that are both true and false. And uh, I'd like to investigate them and look at them. Uh, in this 8th video, I tried something different. I presented the whole of Dr. White's uh, views, in, uh, and then I'm going to critique them now rather than doing them piecemeal. So... Uh, Let's take a look at this. Um, before we begin, um, at the very end of this presentation of Dr. Weiss, I've put some very capital letters, and th what he says there I emphatically agree with. I think he's right on tar target, and that he's saying the exact right thing. But I think it's a problem concerning his argument uh, with the modern text uh, views. So we'll take a look at that when we get to there. Uh, the first point that Dr. White makes, he, he quotes Dr. Gipp um, talking about the originals. And he's like, originals? We don't have any originals. There are no originals today. And uh, yeah, we don't have the autographs, uh, but we do have the original language copies uh, today. And uh, when I take a look at your videos, Dr. White, I could see in the back there you have a very nice large bookcase. And on the top you have uh, some copies of... Um, uh, Turretin's three volumes of um, his Institutes of Atlantic Theology. And uh, volume one is kind of tilted on its side, and uh, this is volume one, and I'd like to point out something he says in volume one. Um, and I'm going to flash it right here on the screen for you. Um, <laughs> in it, Turretin is saying that we can refer to the, uh, the apographia, the copies of the autographs, as being the originals. Uh, the original language translations. And, uh, and so the word originals is not wrong when we're talking about the copies because we have every single word that Matthew, Mark, Luke, Paul, Peter, John wrote uh, in the New Testament that was inspired by God in the copies that we have today. In that one tree, we have the whole of the New Testament that was inspired by God. And again, I will refer you to my quotation from B.B. Warfield in a previous video and uh, uh, for you to look at concerning that question. The originals are in the copies. 
not one copy, but all of the copies, when we compare and collate them, we can come to the original uh, wording of the New Testament. So uh, we can refer to these copies as originals. So the next thing you point out is uh, Gipps, Dr. Gipps' view concerning uh, Antioch and Alexandria. And uh, you say, well, where does, the, where does the Bible teach such a mindset concerning Egypt or Alexandria? And you'll find it in uh, Acts 6-9. Acts 6 9 talks about the synagogue of the Libertines in Alexandria, and, uh, and uh, therefore there's some kind of mindset going on down there that's libertine in nature, that has a mindset or a presupposition or a philosophy as you like it, like determined, that is. Uh, so in Alexandria during the first century, there was a mindset down there that was anti Christian, it was probably antinomian in nature. And I don't think that anybody would uh, argue that, uh, that Antioch was a center for uh, Christianity. I mean, the examples that Dr. Gibbs gives, that, uh, that Christians were first called Christians in Antioch, that uh, Paul, uh, his missionary journey started in Antioch and they ended in Antioch. And in Acts chapter 15, we find that the Antiochian church was troubled by some uh, heretics and so they sent Paul and Barnabas and several others down to Jerusalem to uh, hash it out and see what the truth was. And uh, the Jerusalem church sent back a message saying this is the correct doctrine and as long as you walk in it you will do well. So uh, after Jerusalem fell it would pretty, pretty much be natural for Antioch to be the center of Christianity in the first century. Uh, but then you talk about what happens in the subsequent uh, uh, years. Uh, that's when the manuscripts are being made in the 2nd, the 3rd, the 4th century, going, going on from there. Uh, so you say, uh, well, where is this mindset of Antioch and Alexandria? And then you say, quote someone. Huh? Okay, I'll, I'll quote someone. Um, this is uh, Walter Kaiser's and Moises Silver's uh, book, The Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics being the science of interpreting the Bible. Um, in it, they talk on page 218 of an Alexandrian mindset, an Alexandrian method of interpreting the Bible, which is not correct. I think they got it from, uh, from origin. And uh, in it, on page, that was page 218. On page 221, they talk about an uh, Antiochian mindset, uh, which we would call reform. It was the grammatical, historical, theological uh, view, and uh, it's a philosophy of uh, interpretation that is accepted as biblical among the Reformed. So uh, we have the uh, Alexandrian view that comes from uh, origin, a uh, false view, uh, a false philosophy, if you like, and a false mindset, and we have an uh, Antiochian mindset that is uh, Reformed in nature. So here's an example of a mindset in the second, third, fourth centuries that is not biblical uh, in, in Alexandria and is biblical in Antioch. Now your point is well taken. Athanasius of Alexandria was a godly man. There's no doubt about that. Um, and Arius, who came from Alexandria, settled in Antioch and he propagated his views and it became almost the universal view of the church, such that Jerome would say that the church woke up one day and found itself Aryan in nature. So there are good and bad people everywhere, but there is these mindsets that, um, that, that it is true, uh, maybe not to the extent that Dr. Gipp is trying to point out, but uh, to castigate him the way you did was um, not, I don't think was correct. So finally, um, we come to uh, the part that I fully and absolutely agree with you, and it's those, that part that I put in capital letters. Um, the falsity of the statement, you say, is uh, that uh, these manuscripts come from either one of these two places is simply not true, is essentially what you're saying. And uh, that's true. Uh, unfortunately, what you're saying is that the genealogy doesn't uh, work. It doesn't wash. Uh, you're agreeing with the scholars that I quote in the genealogical argument that, uh, that uh, genealogy just was never proven to be a New Testament thing. However, you lean on the geneolo genealogical argument when you talk about text types. Uh, you demand of the, of the quote, Byzantine uh, group 
to show a early Byzantine manuscript and by doing that you're standing on genealogy you're standing on the idea that there are text types and uh, that's just simply not true you know that it's not true you stated that it's not true so what you're doing is on one hand you're saying okay genealogy is correct therefore we can refute the Byzantine manuscripts and on the other hand you're saying that genealogy is not correct uh, because uh, Dr. Gipp and them are using genealogy or trying to refute this idea of genealogy. So, uh, or they're accepting the idea of genealogy and showing how it doesn't work. So, uh, this is just not true. Your challenge to the Byzantine uh, men, priority men if you want to call them that, uh, can go answered. And we'll look at that in P52 in the next segment. Uh, so let's take a look at what P52 says. So P52. P52 is one of Dr. White's favorite texts. Um, he, he likes it so much he made a tie out of it with, I hope, the recto and the verso on it. Uh, but you can find P52 in Philip Comfort and David Barrett's book, uh, The Text of the Earliest New Testament Greek Manuscripts. And uh, in it, they describe P52. And uh, in their description, they... Uh, they have a little summary here. They talk about the verses that the P52 covers, uh, where it was found in Oxyrhynchris, where you can find it today in the John Ryland's library, um, a short bibliography, and then there's a description of the date and the province, etc. They ha on the next page, they have a copy, a photocopy of the recto side of P52. And uh, But most interesting is, is they have the Greek text of P52 down here at the bottom. It starts down here at the bottom of the page, and then it goes for about two-thirds of the next page and uh, I counted the number of words and it's about two, 253 words plus or minus some but more importantly I looked and compared the uh, text given here with the uh, with the TR with uh, Stevens 1550 and I found only six differences between the 253 words given here and the Texas Receptus the Stevens 1550 which gives you about a 99 98 percent uh, accuracy. In other words, P52 and the Stevens 1550 are the same, almost, just about. So how can you not say that this isn't a Byzantine manuscript? Uh, they call it an Alexandrian because it's found in Oxyrhynchris, which is in Egypt, and uh, it's an older text, and according to the standard operating procedure, any old text is considered Alexandrian. But there's a 99% affinity between P52 and Stevens 1550. Given the fact that Stevens, that uh, Erasmus, that Beza, that the Elsevier brothers didn't know about P52, this shows the continuity between the old texts and the Byzantine Ma and the Byzantine the Textus Receptus. There is a continuity between the older texts and the, and the Byzantine, and the Byzantine um, are the uh, the true copies of the originals, it's not surprising that the older texts will show affinities between uh, themselves and the Byzantine manuscripts. Um, so P52 can be considered a Byzantine manuscript as well as an Alexandrian manuscript. And uh, that's the conundrum for Dr. White to, to, to give an answer to. Thank you very much for watching this video. May God bless you. And this video is for Christ and Christ alone. Amen.